after a few weeks on the beach, the Formula One circus returns to action and heads to the beach. It's the Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort and this is Tech Talk where we talk about all of the detailed upgrades on all of the cars and that's exactly what we're going to do today. Show you every single upgrade on every single car which this weekend is quite easy but we're going to start off with Red Bull Racing who have introduced a new front wing to their car. You can see it here both Yuki Tsunoda and Max Verstappen got their first taste of it in free practice one but before I go into the details let's hear from Paul Monaghan of the Red Bull Racing team who was talking to Mike Seymour and Mike was desperately trying to extract some information from Paul that Paul perhaps didn't want to give him right away. Let's have a listen in. Paul, good to see you. First of all, can you tell us about the front wing change for this weekend? What's changed and, and why? In front of your ears are a pair of eyes. <laughs> you should go and have a look and answer your own question. We, we'd really? like to hear your, your okay, input on it. So, this is a sort of circuit which has quite um, a lot of front wing demand. Now, if you're going to put a big rear wing on, then you need a big front wing to go with it. So one method we can do this by not you know, making different types of front wing for different circuits is to simply extend the front wing flap. So if you're going to have a look, say, compare it to, or oh, where have we been, Silverstone? And if you look at the front flap that ran there versus the one that runs here, you'll see it's just a little bit longer. So the more area you add, the more surface that can hold a pressure difference, the more load you extract from it, there you are. Never comes for free, as you might imagine. So uh, yeah, that's a trade we've chosen to play here is to put that up and do it that way. Well, that's absolutely fascinating stuff. I'm a big fan of Paul Monaghan and his way of transmitting information, shall we say. Uh, he suggested we take a look at the wing Red Bull Racing used at Silverstone and compare it to the wing used at Zandvoort. Actually, what I thought we'd do is take a look at the wing used in Zandvoort and compare it to last time out at the Hungarian Grand Prix, because that really shows you how different the two wing profiles are at two circuits that both have quite high downforce levels. Now, here we start on the new front wing and you can see this shape here as it comes down from above the sponsor logo here. You can just notice on the upper edge, there's a little coil of a gurney flap, a wicker bill, for example, and you can see that very clearly on this shape of the wing. And it's this whole upper element here that is reshaped, as is this lower element, the third element in the stack, slightly lowered down. Now, if we take a look at the wing used at the Hungarian Grand Prix, you can see it's actually a completely different shape on this section from above the sponsor logo, but also a completely different shape on the outboard section as it comes down to that point where it meets the front wing end plate. Really quite a different design, actually. And again, this is down to the different demands of the different circuit. Zandvoort is a slightly odd circuit, isn't it? Because it's quite flowing through its layout, but it's not particularly fast. In fact, they had to put those banked corners in to increase the average speed and make it easier to overtake around that layout. And again, you can see the third element has also been reshaped quite significantly compared to the wing we saw used in free practice one. Not a great free practice, it has to be said, for either of the Red Bulls, both Max Verstappen and Yuki Tsunoda ending up in the gravel trap at different sections of the session in slightly odd circumstances. And it does raise the argument of, is it really worth developing the Red Bull much more when there's a new rulebook coming into play next season? And any development on this car would automatically, because of the aerodynamic testing restrictions, take away from development on next year's car. Well, Paul Monaghan seems to think it is still worth bringing new parts to the car. And here's why. People sometimes ask me, why are you doing anything on this car? It's, no, it's irrelevant. It's not. You always learn something, even if it becomes um, not necessarily a philosophical pursuit, but you understand more of um, what works on this car may or may not work on next year's. But... You, inc you increase your um, knowledge database, if you like. So you're, you never have a bad lesson. Yes, we'll try and get some updates onto this car. The magnitude of them is getting trimmed by, I wouldn't describe 2026 as on the horizon. I think it's pretty much absolutely slap bang in front of us. And more and more effort has to move to that car. Otherwise, we will not be ready in January. Well, there you have it from the horse's mouth, so to speak. But the biggest upgrade, perhaps, for Red Bull this season isn't on this year's car, and it probably won't have a big impact on next year's car either. And that's back at the factory where Red Bull are in the middle of a huge construction project on a brand new wind tunnel. When that will be open, we don't yet know. But to get an update on the progress so far, well, Paul was still talking to Mike. It's a vast building, 
and um, progress is swift. It, it's uh, it's mighty impressive. We're a little way off running it yet, so um, hopefully it is a step up on what we have now, and it's up to us to sort it out and get it ready, isn't it? Just how much goes into something like that? And, More and than changeover. you can possibly imagine. It's a remarkable bit of kit. The building and the, the tubular structure, if you like, is a small fraction of everything to get it ready. Um, if ever we let you in there, which I might have something to say about naturally, you would begin to see the complexity that goes into the phenomenal bits of kit. Um, maybe you should ask the people in green if you can go and see theirs. They've got a nice new one. Uh, it is remarkable, quite remarkable. How, uh, how would you put it, how refined that measurement has to be such you can work with it in diminishing returns. Well, it'll be interesting to see when Red Bull's wind tunnel comes on stream, how much a difference it will make to the team's performance. It's some way in the distance for now. But right now, we need to look at another car upgrade in Zandvoort. And we're going to take a look at the very detailed rear brake duct cluster of the Alpine. And you can see it here. Now, Alpine has modified the car in this area, and we'll get back to that. But I just wanted to show you a really nice little engineering detail on this rear brake duct layout. You can see the cooling outlet here, the main rear duct outlet, just, just in the inner face of the rear wheels. But look here, further forward, there's a secondary exit of the airflow that comes in to the front of the brake duct this way. And it seems to be exiting this way in addition to the airflow that comes out here. Just a really nice little engineering detail. I'm not sure it's particularly new, but it's just a nice little detail to show you how intricate these elements on the cars are. And one of the other teams that have modified this area of the car is Sauber. And again, I'm just going to marvel on the beautiful engineering that's gone into this before I let the engineers tell you what they've really changed and why. Just have a look at these little outlets on the inner face of the main outlet of the rear brake cluster. And then you can see these little stacks of sticky inny bits, I guess we'll have to call them, up above and below that main duct outlet. Just lovely bits of engineering, lovely amount of engineering work gone into it. And it's interesting to see at this point of the season when a lot of effort is being focused on next year already. But with such a tight constructors championship battle, I think there is still a bit more to come. But to understand a little bit more about this area of the car, and why so many teams are putting so much effort into it. We asked the two teams that have introduced new parts this weekend on that part of the car exactly why they've changed the parts, what they've changed, and why it makes such a big difference. Uh, well, it's a small change on the back of the brake duct. Uh, we're still looking every easy opportunity to improve the car, and we may have found something interesting, so we'll have a try today. If you look at our rear brake duct, we have a little, little flick. It's, honestly, it's really difficult to see. But if you look at it, it's uh, an area in which there's a lot of development. There's lots of little winglets, and we've just made one last development in that area. It's been quite a significant area of development with this current generation of car. Uh, just how powerful is it, and does it directly generate downforce as well? I think this area is powerful for many aspects. One is for direct downforce, one is for how you manipulate the uh, airflow and the wheel wake, which will impact the floor performance and then there could be other implications on the uh, tar cooling. So it's quite a productive area if everything works. So that area of the car is super developed, as you see, because it, it serves many purposes. It serves the purpose of the exit of the, the exit of the flow from the diffuser, the exit of the flow from the bodywork, and on top of that, it also is very critical to how much tire temperatures you gather and how you actually bleed the temperature from your rear brakes basically so one of you know tires are a big talking point and you, tires generate or the, around the rim and the tire we have two heat sources one is the one of the tires sliding on the surface which you cannot really get around okay well maybe with lift and coast and stuff like that and then the other heat source is the one from the brakes we have really hot steaming brakes that are actually radiating uh, the temperature from the inside so these flicks around that part of the car help not just with the downforce of the floor and the bodywork, as I said, but also to contain the heat coming out of the brakes. Could you give us a bit of insight on development still to come this year? Are there many parts coming? You've obviously got 2026 to think about that balance. So most of the shift has been focused to 26. But of course, this doesn't preclude that if you find something obvious, okay, what, what do I mean by something obvious? By running on the track, something breaks and you improve it. 
that is a way of, of still carry out development or because there were some simulations that can be still run in the background without hampering 2026 development. Those will come. So, for example, the flick that you see on the breakdown was not programmed to be an upgrade here, but it, it did come. So if everything goes to plan, we, we're not bringing any more upgrades. Okay, but uh, undoubtedly there will be a hit thing here or there, either for reliability or a slight performance advantage that will come. Well, that's really, really interesting. And that's it for all of the upgrades from Zanfort. However, this isn't the end of the story because there has been some on-track action since we all broke up for the summer holidays. Haas went to Fuji Speedway in Japan and nearly broke the lap record with a two-year-old car. They didn't actually have the correct rear wing for the circuit layout, so couldn't quite get to the lap record, but were within a few tenths of beating that mark with two Toyota drivers at the wheel, Sho Suboy and Ryo Hirakawa. That's an interesting project to watch. Ferrari have been testing for the 2026 tyre compounds with Pirelli. We'll get back to all of that later in the year. The other bit of breaking news that's happened during the summer break, or actually just in the few days leading up to Zandvoort, is that Formula One's newest team, Cadillac, the General Motors owned operation, is going to start testing before the end of the season. The problem is that Cadillac doesn't actually have a Grand Prix car. Now, the team in its early phases of entering the World Championship did design a car to the 2025 technical regulations, but it never built it. It never got past the wind tunnel model stage. So to do testing, the team has to get a car from somewhere and it's decided to essentially borrow one from another team. Now, we don't know the identity of that team yet, but running a previous car, maybe a two or three year old car, is allowed within the regulations, even if it's being run by a different team. And that will allow the team to get all of its operation in place and get the machine running as slickly as possible. So they don't turn up at the first race of next year, really in a bit of a muddle. They, they will use this car to test and develop the team not test and develop the car. But, you know, with two well-established drivers behind the wheel, perhaps that old phrase, there's nothing as quick as a rental car, will come back to everybody's minds when they put that car out on track in the coming weeks and months. I can't wait to see that, but before we get into any of that detail, we've got an awful lot more to come in 2025, and I cannot wait to see what the teams turn up with at Monza.